male person comes in and and he says, uh, you know, I've heard you doing uh, these um, transgender procedures <laughs> and you did them really well. And, um, you know, can you do in the same surgery my nose, my face, my boobs and the, the important part down there as well? <laughs> and he's like in front of my staff saying, because you did it so well on this other person. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. I can't believe it is already April. It's our third month of season two, and this month is proudly brought to us by Marina Medical. Uh, Marina Medical makes some amazing rhinoplasty instruments, so a shout out to them for enabling this podcast. And the theme for this month is endonasal rhinoplasty, and I've got some very great and interesting guys I've been interviewing. And the first person to kick this whole thing off is none other than Holger Gassner. Holger, thank you so much for availing yourself to be on the podcast today. You're very welcome. Glad to be here. So Holger, for the listeners um, around the world, we've got like from people from like 70 countries around the world. Where are you at the moment? Well, uh, I'm at my surgical center here in Regensburg, which is about 45 minutes uh, north and east of, of Munich. Um, you continue from Munich along the airport, and that, then it's another good half hour. Cool, man. And now, now, so Holger, I'm not somebody to box people into little boxes of saying, this is your endonasal rhinoplasty, because the, the two things that really strike me about what you've done is you are massive in facial plastic surgery, not just in rhinoplasty, but also my understanding is you did a lot of training in America as well. So maybe take us on, on where did your journey start and how did you end up where you are now? Uh, well, this, the journey started uh, with a day uh, in the OR with uh, David Sherris at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, I was a student. I did my doctoral thesis. It was the first time I saw a rib rhinoplasty. It was two rib rhinoplasties uh, back to back and he did it open and he did it um, very, very well. And, and um, that was kind of one of those key, uh, key experiences. And uh, from that day on, I knew this is what I wanted to learn. And so the story was that, you know, I kept coming back to Mayo and then um, eventually did a two year research fellowship with uh, David and Gene Kern. Um, scrapped a lot with both of them, scrapped a lot with Gene Kern too. And so they were such, you know, contrary in their, in their methodology, uh, David being very the open structure, Johnson, uh, Toriomi kind of guy, and Gene, the uh, very preserving in the truest sense of the word, endonasal, minimal tissue dissection, um, minimal or no grafting, a um, lot of uh, uh, letdown procedures, 30 minute procedures. So very different in what they did. They, they were cooperating so very well and uh, were such good friends. And so uh, I got welcome into their rearm if you want. And then the story was that um, subsequently I matched into the Mayo Clinic residency training program, did my five years there. And then uh, did the fellowship that David Cheris did with uh, Wayne Larrabee, Craig Murakami, and Chris Mill in Seattle. And then, as I always wanted to, I came back to Germany, found what I think is Germany's most beautiful place in Regensburg, and I directed the Division of Facial Plastic Surgery here at the university for 10 years. And then I built my own surgery center uh, five years ago. So that's the story. And then in terms of surgery, I was trained, um, I had important endonasal influences, uh, most notably by Gene Kern, who really, uh, you know, coined a lot of what I am as a rhinoplasty surgeon. David Sherris, who is uh, just phenomenal in his influence on me, uh, but that he was open. Um, and there, there were other influences, including Yanis Konstantinidis, uh, Matthias Winter, um, and then very important in my later career, Norman Pastoric. Um, so these were the influences. And then I switched from being trained during my residency and fellowship, 100% open, um, to 
switching pretty quickly to 100% endonasal, and that's truly 100%. And that was about in the second year of, of me being staff in Regensburg. So that was back in 2008. And I've been doing, uh, you know, I do all comers. So I do off the about 220, maybe it's a little bit more rhinoplasties a year. I do about exactly half revisions. And that includes congenital um, clefts, trauma, saddle, vaginus, everything. And so of the 220 plus rhinoplasties a year, there's maybe one or no open approach. So that's the, that's kind of the mix and that's what I've been living. And so I guess over the past 14 years, it's been around 3000 endonasal rhinoplasties. So that's kind of the foundation um, that I'm sitting on. Okay, so now in amongst this, this is amazing. I mean, you've been on the shoulders of giants here. Quick question, how does South Africa fit into this? Uh, important question. Um, I did an elective at the, um, the Weinberg Hospital as a, as a final year medical student and uh, enjoyed living in Cape Town. It was awesome. I um, was really impressed by uh, you know, the clinical abilities of, of the physicians there. That was really an eye-opener. I mean, we, we essentially had no diagnostic means other than our eyes, ears, fingers. And um, what these guys uh, did, I remember very vividly, it was two consultants, Dr. Turk and Dr. O'Keefe, and uh, most of, you know, being able to deduct from clinical examination, I learned there. So, um, yeah, I only have fond memories. I bought a, a Mercedes that was uh, as old as I was at the time and uh, took my girlfriend on a, on a tour through Namibia, Botswana, and Zimbabwe through the Caprini Strip. So very, very memorable and uh, beautiful experience. Uh, so, yeah, can't wait to come back. The other thing is I have two wonderful, um, wonderful fellows at the moment, um, Francesco Ordones uh, from Ecuador, but he's got a German medical license, and then if, um, Louise de Lange, she's my current fellow. Uh, she went through plastics and trauma training in uh, Tigerberg. Uh, she um, was on staff. She's a very seasoned surgeon, and it's been a pleasure working with those two. So there's, a, there's also a, my connection with with South Africa. Oh, that's great, eh? Okay, so one of the people you mentioned was Dean Turiomi, and I, I spent uh, a week with him last month. It was so interesting uh, just to be around with, with him and spend the time. And he's had the seismic shift of open structural pres uh, like rhinoplasty to this move towards preservation rhinoplasty and, and doing more endonasal stuff. And that's very interesting. Um, at the same time, I, I think it's strange how there's this been this new resurgence of so-called preservation rhinoplasty. I'm very interested to know your thoughts around that, because I know you guys as a group, there's a really powerful uh, teaching group of endonasal rhinoplasty. So the, the kind of the thing in my mind, the two things is your thoughts on preservation. And also if where you had this amazing training with, 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 Dean Tardy and them, where they actually work together with structural or open and endonasal work, that worked very well. Should there not be a change in our views that we should rather look at seeing how we can work together as groups and also not use this as a social like media um, platform to say, oh, look at me, I do preservation rhinoplasty? Um. We've been talking about this a lot in the endonasal group. I think there's been a seismic shift for us um, about three years ago when Matt Constantian introduced the purely endonasal meetings, and that really has changed everything for us. Um, uh, there is something that's called orthodox treatment bias. Um, so if you have a method that's maybe easier to learn, easier to perform, and is being performed by, by a majority, it is usually self-preserving, if, if you will. So there's self-preservation. So what happens, and that happens across the medical field, you could observe it, for example, with open cardiac surgery uh, versus uh, endovascular stenting. 
Uh, and that bias leads to the preeminent treatment remaining dominant because, um, you know, the programs are influenced, the editorial boards are influenced and all that. And so, rightfully so, you know, the method that you personally prefer, you try to preserve and defend. That's just a very natural thing. And so I think that's one thing we've observed, observed with the two approaches, open versus end of nasal. And so in the uh, remarkable success of these endonasal events, which have totally surprised us. I mean, we've had about 16 now, we've had up to a thousand and more uh, participants in these webinars. We've got the third major meeting coming up. We've got the European course in endonasal rhinoplasty coming up in May here in Regensburg with, with uh, life surgery and such. So all of a sudden, we've had an entity that was in a way protected and we could share our own thoughts without this being labeled as purely a different approach, same operation, different approach. So that was something that uh, kind of broke that pattern of orthodox treatment bias a little bit for us. Uh, preservation. Um, I have the greatest respect for Dean and in my story in endonasal was trying to do what Dean did open through endonasal uh, accesses. That was my personal journey and that uh, I think distinguishes what I do a lot from other great guys like, um, like Norman or like Abel Jan who are more like the small pocket sheen type uh, endonasal rhinoplasty surgeons, a little bit more touch and feel. I am wide endonasal exposure, see everything, uh, do everything under vision, show the fellow. So there's a, there's a little difference. Um, so this is my tribute to Dean because he's also a very honest guy. Um, now, uh, in terms of uh, preservation, 60% uh, of the nose is soft tissue, okay? Um, so 40% is skeletal. Of the of the 40%, maybe a quarter is the middle third, so we're talking about 10%. So you're, so you're preserving 10% of the structure. Um, what about the other 90%? Uh, and so what we've suggested and what Abelian and I have published is, uh, has the scientific community even invested due diligence in researching and analyzing how much we should preserve to label the procedure as such. And I think that's still an open question. We've identified 15 important components of nasal anatomy that should be ideally preserved. Um, what is the ideal nose? Okay, so the ideal nose looks beautiful, looks natural, doesn't look operated, breathes well, has ideal physiologic function, has no grafts in them, has no suture in them, and has no scars, i.e. the ideal grown nose. That's what you want your daughter and your wife to have, okay? You don't want them to have an operated nose in the first place. Now, if we decide to operate we still want this as our ideal reference. A nose with no grafts, no, you know, touch, feel, breathe, everything as natural as possible. So if that's our goal, and I think everyone would agree on that, then we want to change as little as possible in the nose, both soft tissue and skeletal, no question, okay? And so that's why, you know, Norman Pistoric has been such a role model for me. And he's done probably almost a dozen life surgeries here in Regensburg. And invariably, invariably, the outcomes were outstanding. The effort was minimal. And he is, he usually does everything under local anesthesia. So for me, that in itself is a mark of quality. If somebody can do a nose under local anesthesia, it excludes a lot of aggressive techniques in the first place. Okay, so now we're talking about so-called preservation. Uh, I grew up with, I grew up in Eugene Kern's OR. Be a minimalist in the OR. You know, I cannot, 
I cannot uh, forget all these words. Be a maximist in the in clinic. Be a minimalist in surgery. He did a leg down procedure. He didn't even do dorsal undermining. It would take him literally 25 minutes. It was a beautiful result. It was quick. It was bloodless. And that truly, to me, was a very preserving procedure. You know? And then if you look at what do you preserve, um, to me, the lymphatic and venous drainage system is critical. And so transecting the most important gravity-dependent uh, drainage system with the columella veins and, uh, and lymphatics, uh, with the potential of neurovascular uh, denervation of the skin long-term. Um, doing, you know, releasing the lateral keystone area, doing aggressive osteotomies, not basal, but cranial, um, doing mobilizing osteotomies, um, taking transplants from the septum, taking a lot of material for, from the septum. Uh, and I could continue, but all these things contribute to being conservative or not. And maybe we should skip the now very, I think, used term of preservation because it's just so preloaded. But um, maybe we should have in the beginning you know, taken an open and scientific approach and ask ourselves the question, what can we accept to qualify for preservation in the first place and what not? But I think we've missed that. And so um, I think all will agree that there's an element of PR and marketing in this, and, and, uh, and that's always not a good scientific thing. Um, and then the other thing, Norman Pastorek said, you know, it has taken me three decades to optimize the techniques uh, of dorsal recontouring. And there's no way, you know, I could have known 10 years into this where I am. And I still made important mistakes after 20 years. And I had stabilized after 40 years. That's what he says. So somebody who does high volume, who's very critical with himself, who's an outstanding technician, and he says he needs thousands of rhinoplasties and decades to arrive. Uh, I listen to that very carefully and I think it makes me humble. And in that regard, I, I cannot see that the resurgence of a technique that was strong in good hands like Gene Kern and then got abandoned for reasons and now sees a massive resurgence in a very, very short period of time with follow-up that can't be sufficient. Um, it, to me, it hasn't stood the test of time, not quite. And maybe in 10 years from now, if it's still there, uh, we have more substance to talk about. So, and then there's two elements, you know, is this the better method of addressing the skeleton of the nasal dorsum? That's one thing. But then is this more preserving globally? That's also a very important question to, to address. And, and, uh, and I think we've got, we've got work to do there. So, Holger, it, it, you know, the, the feeling that I get after having now just come back from two weeks overseas and being in the Bergamo meeting and stuff, myself. Now, I've been doing rhinoplasty for quite a few years now, but if you're starting out, it seems almost that it's like an insurmountable mountain now because there's so much more out there how are you going to get these results? So what, what would your advice be for, for guys who are kind of at the beginning of their career or want to make a career out of facial plastics and rhinoplasty? I, I think you're specifically asking about endonasal, and that's the, big, that's the big downside of endonasal because we don't have teaching centers uh, anymore. We, um, it's self-propagating. Oh, you know, it's a... Some people say it's a, it's a dying uh, specialty. 
Uh, it's not. It's not. It's uh, it's coming back. Um, I was very fortunate to be trained in very high volumes with the open approach, and I would have never arrived at being an endonasal surgeon without that exposure. No question. So the open approach has its merits, no question. And, you know, am I religious about methods and approaches? No. And if, you know, my daughter needed a rhinoplasty and Dean was to do it without thinking, you know, you need a good surgeon and adequate methodology. And there's a lot of adequate methodology. So, uh, endonasal open preservation or uh, or standard, it's probably a lot less important than we think. I just talked to Luis and, and Francisco about that. Reading previous op notes, it's almost inconsequential to know what the previous surgeon did because you can get into a nose and it's all wonderful, pristine and the right planes and it comes apart and it's a very easy revision or that surgeon was in a lot of different planes and uh, depleted the septum, there's only a small l strut and um, there's not much to work with and becomes a very, very difficult revision, even though the op notes may be exactly the same. So I think we're talking way too much about methods and way too little about what's so important is the quality of execution because it's very hard to research, no question. So uh, that being said, um, open rhinoplasty is an essential part of training a rhinoplasty surgeon, essential. Now, there, there is probably a point where you can hopefully uh, include endonasal. The problem is you may be in your practice and you may be devoted to a certain degree of quality and you may have a problem switching to a method that no question is a shallow alerting curve. And so I think that's what withholds uh, surgeons uh, to really make that switch. And my experience um, with the, you know, with my fellows and my, with my rotating physicians, I'm going more and more to more experienced guys. And um, the feedback that I'm getting, um, like, you know, Paya Maneshi or Darinka Hanga, I'm getting photographs and videos of them doing Indonesian complete release approaches and doing really advanced stuff. And so um, probably, you know, uh, finding the time and energy and commitment a little bit later in your, in your training to then um, embark on the Indonesian approach, it takes, it takes a little bit of resistance to get through. Um, but, uh, and then you need time. It, it, you really need time and it probably takes a year um, even for experienced uh, guys to understand the fundamentally different philosophies and approaches um, that, you know, Indonesia brings about. It's not a different approach. It's a different, it's a different um, operation altogether. And so, uh, uh, yeah, we need training centers and then we need trainees who have the commitment. Yes. Okay, I'll go. Another question altogether. In amongst all of this <clears throat> that you're doing, you're very passionate about board exams and facial plastic surgery. Just tell us a little bit about your role internationally in that. Well, the, the board exam, um, you know, there's the European Board for Certification Facial Plastic Surgery, and and it's a, it's within the family of the uh, American Board and International Board. So it's a it's a group of um, societies or boards. It's very very different from the academies, and and uh, that's probably would be a very important uh, clear distinction to you know communicate in an acceptable acceptable fashion uh, also from that side um, the European and American international board administer the board exam and the board certification system and it's globally accepted the gold standard in um, facial plastic surgery certification 
If I may say from the European board perspective, I've been honored to be the president uh, in the third year now, and we have passed 100 board certified diplomates. So it's a strong group. There's uh, countries where it is at at least strongly suggested by the political bodies, and it also gives you a lot of a lot of strength, a, a solid foundation, also in the medical legal sense in Europe as as well as worldwide. Um, all my fellows do it. I think um, you know a lot, or most of the young guys who have ambitions in facial plastic surgery in, in Europe do it. So it's probably become an essential, and and uh, uh, I've been very. Yeah, very pleased to see that that development. Uh, so I can only recommend it to to the entire community. Oh, that's awesome. Well, hopefully, middle of this year we'll have three more people have passed that exam for South Africa. So there'll be four of us in our country who's going to have it. It'll be fantastic. Good. Okay, so Olga, let me try and think. I know you got to get back into the OR. Last last question. Um, tell us a, a funny thing that's happened to you uh, with fellows in the past. Or with patients, maybe you've got a funny story you can share with the listeners. A particular story? You got you got me there on the wrong foot. Uh, no, um, <laughs> you know, doesn't <laughs> happen. We are often. having a lot of we are having a lot of fun in the OR every day. Um, <laughs> Or maybe your worst uh, moment you've had in theatre, where you just felt this thing has fallen apart now, and it didn't turn out as bad as you initially anticipated it. To be. It's funny, you know. This, these are live moments, uh, and. Um, Maybe, maybe this, maybe this guy. Um, uh, <laughs> so, so I got this uh, very, um, uh, very outgoing hairdresser, you know, and he's wearing lipstick and he's wearing, he's wearing uh, makeup and he's got the long hair and, and so. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> He wants his rhinoplasty done, and so I, I, I'm a little bit a little bit wary about these patients. I, I really don't, you know, if this becomes sex reassignment, I'm very careful. If this is just a, a gay person who wants to look more feminine and is uh, is reasonable about it, um, very good. So he was the latter, and and you know, I I. I uh, do the surgery and he's happy and he comes in with his partner and, and um, about 12 weeks later, uh, so, and I, I'm starting to get patients from him, you know, from his hairdresser salon up till today, you know, and then uh, this, I don't know what the communication was, but this this male person comes in and, and he says, uh, you know, I've heard you doing uh, these uh, transgender procedures <laughs> and you did them really well. And, um, you know, can you do in the same surgery, my nose, my face, my boobs, and the, the important part down there as well. <laughs> and, he, and he's like in front of my staff saying, because you did it so well on this other person. <laughs> That's classic, eh? Sure. All right, so that was it. That was a oh, memorable thing. Right, you know, I had to paddle my, my way backwards, saying I'm, do, I'm doing only nose and, and face and uh, nothing below the, the, below the shoulders. <laughs> so those are the things that happen. And, and, um, but, you know, nothing, nothing ever really bad. And I hope no, nothing ever bad will come out of this very elective surgery. Awesome, man. Well, Olga, thank you so much. Eh? It's so nice just to listen to you, hear what you're doing. Um, and and this, just this, this relentless work that you're doing for Indonesia rhinoplasty. And thank you. On behalf of the listeners around the world, thank you. Really, really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you for your time this afternoon as well. And a shout out to Marina Medical again for enabling us to run this month. Guys, the, 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 the names that have been mentioned are coming up late in the month. So make sure next week you come back to listen to the podcast again. So 
Olga, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, having you on the show. Well, thank you for your energy and uh, for pushing this. This is good for all of us. And uh, best regards to South Africa. 